So Genesis chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, if you'd follow along with me there in your copy of God's Word. It said, Sarah lived 127 years. These were the years of the life of Sarah. And Sarah died at Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And Abraham went in to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. And Abraham rose up from before his dead and said to the Hittites, I am a sojourner and foreigner among you. Give me property among you for a burying place, that I may bury my dead out of my sight. The Hittites answered Abraham, Hear us, my lord, you are a prince of God among us. Bury your dead in the choicest of our tombs. None of us will withhold from you his tomb to hinder you from burying your dead. Abraham rose and bowed to the Hittites, the people of the land, and he said to them, If you are willing that I should bury my dead out of my sight, hear me and entreat for me Ephron, the son of Zohar, that he may give me the cave of Machpelah, which he owns. It is at the end of his field. For the full price let him give it to me in your presence as property for a burying place. Now Ephron was sitting among the Hittites, and Ephron the Hittite answered Abraham in the hearing of the Hittites, of all who went in at the gate of his city, no, my lord, hear me. I give you the field, and I give you the cave that is in it. In the sight of the sons of my people, I give it to you. Bury your dead. Then Abraham bowed down before the people of the land, and he said to Ephron in the hearing of the people of the land, but if you will, hear me. I give the price of the field, accept it from me that I may bury my dead there. Ephron answered, Abraham, my Lord, listen to me. A piece of land worth 400 shekels of silver. What is that between you and me? Bury your dead. Abraham listened to Ephron and Abraham weighed out for Ephron the silver that he had named in the hearing of the Hittites. 400 shekels of silver according to the weights current among the merchants. So the field of Ephron in Machpelah, which was to the east of Mamre, the field with the cave that was in it, and all the trees that were in the field throughout its whole area was made over to Abraham as a possession in the presence of the Hittites, before all who went in at the gate of his city. After this, Abraham buried Sarah his wife in the cave of the field of Machpelah, east of Mamre, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. The field and the cave that is in it were made over to Abraham as property for a burying place by the Hittites. Let's pray. Father, again, we come before your holy word. Lord, we seek your help. We seek your guidance in these moments as we look to understand rightly the profound significance of this 23rd chapter of the book of Genesis. Lord, would you help us? As we consider these verses and these words and these phrases that we see here in this story that is unfolding before us in this chapter, the, the, the prospect of death and the hope of eternity. And so, Lord, in these moments, would you be honored and glorified in all that we say and do, that the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts would be acceptable before you. And it's in your Son's holy name that we pray. Amen. I remember about fifth grade, we had a a grandparents day at at my uh, school that I was attending at the time. And although not all of my grandparents could come to that particular grandparents day, I remember as as a fifth grader realizing how blessed I was uh, to have all four of my grandparents still alive. Many of my classmates, their their grandparents were already dead. Some of them never knew some of their grandparents. And I had the privilege and honor to, to know my grandparents. I remember even as a boy uh, just understanding how profound that was and how thankful I was that God gave me that tremendous opportunity. Over the next three years though I would lose three of my four grandparents and a great grandmother and so very early on in my life I was faced with the prospect of death as, as, as many of us have. If you've never faced the the death of a loved one, it will come at some point. Death is inevitable. Death is coming to all of us. And yet we're reminded in the passage this morning that in the face of death, we as God's people have a hope that rests beyond the grave. I want us to consider two things in this passage this morning. I want us to first consider the sorrow of death that is coming and the promise of life that is certain for those who believe in Christ. 
And so if you would, can turn your attention to verses 1 and 2 as we consider this first truth. The sorrow of death is coming. Death is coming to us all, even those of us who have life in Christ. And verses 1 and 2 is an announcement of death. Death is a theme of Genesis that we were forced to deal with early on in the book. You remember after the fall, one of the first stories is when Cain kills his brother Abel. And then there in chapter 5, the first genealogy that we have in the Bible, at the naming of each of the fathers from Abraham to Noah, there's a three-word phrase that follows each of the, the, the lives of these men, and that is this, and he died. Death is the outworking of the fall and sin. Death is coming to us all. And although we haven't really considered death in the life of the family of Abraham, here suddenly and unexpectedly as death comes to us in this life, we come to learn that Sarah has died This one who waited so patiently for the Lord after many years of barrenness to finally have a son. She's gone. She is dead. And as we read the story as readers, we feel the weight of sorrow, of death, that we see in Abraham himself at the end of verse 2 when it says, Abraham went in to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. When the writer says that he went in to mourn for her, he's telling us there that Abraham would have done all of the things culturally that would have been done in that day to mourn the loss of a loved one. He would have cut his beard. He would have put ashes and dust on his head. He would have fasted. But notice the two particular words that the writer emphasizes here to tell us the emotion and the weight of the sorrow that Abraham feels there. He mourned for her and he wept for her. It's not often in the narrative, in the stories of the Bible, for the writer to pull back the curtain and to tell us the emotion of the characters. And sometimes we do ourselves a disservice when we read the stories of the Bible to try to figure out what the emotion was. And so we might think to ourselves, I wonder how Mary felt riding on the donkey on the way to Bethlehem. But the writer of that story in the New Testament of Mary riding on the donkey to Bethlehem in the, in, the, in the sovereignty of the Holy Spirit, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, does not give us those details. But here in verse 2, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, we're told that Abraham mourned and wept for his wife. We feel the sorrow, the weight, the emotion of death. And although Abraham and Sarah at this point had laid claim to some portions of land, and they had a well to their name, and at this point the son of promise has come, they have Isaac. Abraham, at the death of his wife, comes to realize that the promise has not yet been fulfilled and will not be fulfilled completely in his lifetime. They haven't taken possession of the land. There is no nation to be had. It is just he and his wife and this one son. The promise will not be fulfilled in Abraham's lifetime. And so the question then becomes for Abraham, what is to come of the promise, Lord? What is to happen to the promise that you made to me? That a great nation would come for me and you would give me this land. What happens to that now, Lord? And he asks this in the face of death. And we do the same. At the loss of a loved one, we ask, what now, God? Where are your promises now? And yet the text reminds us that even in the face of death, for those of us who are in Christ, we understand that the end of this life is just the beginning of eternity. And although we are sorrowful and mournful in seasons of death in this life, we rejoice in the hope of heaven that is to come. One of my heroes of the faith is is a missionary by the name of John Payton who went to the New Hebrus Islands in the late 1800s with his wife Mary to reach a tribe of cannibals that were on the island there. And they arrived on the island in November. And Mary was pregnant with their first child. And uh, their first child was born on February 12th. 
The reason I can remember that is because that's my birthday. I'm not great at remembering dates. He was born on February 12th. And before the baby turned a month old, he and his mother Mary had died because of complications to living on a tropical island in those days. And John Payton, in the first several months of being on this island to reach this cannibal tribe with the gospel, was forced to dig the grave of his wife and his firstborn son with his own hands and to place them in the ground because he, he was alone. He was there by himself. I want to read to you a, a portion of his diary, his journal, and I want you to hear the sorrow of death but the hope of heaven. He said this, I felt her loss beyond all conception or description in that dark land. It was very difficult to be resigned, left alone and in sorrowful circumstances, but feeling immovably assured that my God and Father was too wise and loving to err in anything that he does or permits, I looked up to the Lord for help and struggled on in his work. He goes on to say, I do not pretend to see through the mystery of such visitations, wherein God calls away the young, the promising, and those sorely needed for his service here. But this I do know and feel, that in the light of such dispensations, it, is because, uh, it becomes us all to love and serve our blessed Lord Jesus, so that we may be ready at his call for death and eternity. Dear friend, death is coming. But in death, there is hope for the believer. And so we do not mourn as the pagans do, as Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 4. Because death has lost its sting. And although we still feel the sorrow and the grief of death, we rejoice in the face of death, knowing that our hope is not found in this life. Paul speaks of this in 1 Corinthians 6 where he says that we are sorrowful yet always rejoicing. There is sorrow to be had in this life. We see that in Abraham as he mourns and weeps for his wife. Jesus himself wept for his friend Lazarus at his death. Each of us in this place this morning can relate to the sorrow of pain and suffering, and death, and yet Paul says in the midst of that sorrow, we are always rejoicing. Why? Because again, our hope is not found in this life, but in the one to come where Christ is. And so, dear friend, build your theology of death today. Don't wait for the death of a loved one for you to consider these realities. Come to understand the truth of death and the hope that we have in the face of death at the cross of Christ. And know this, that God's promises extend beyond the grave. We see that Abraham affirmed this in his actions that he takes after the death of his wife. So first, we see this, that the sorrow of death is coming, but secondly, we see the promise of life is certain for those who hope in the Lord. We see this in verses 3 through 20. In the first two verses, we have the announcement of Sarah's death, and normally in this type of writing and literature, the burial announcement would follow immediately after that, but we don't see the burial announcement until verses 19 and 20. So from verses 3 to verse 18, there is this exchange that happens between Abraham and the Hittites and Abraham, this one Ephron, that takes up the majority of the chapter. Something important is happening here that we see in the actions that Abraham takes at the death of his wife that's so important for us to see here. Primarily, in these verses, Abraham is simply doing this. He's looking to secure a place to bury his dead wife. So let's first look at the, the progression of the story. We see Abraham makes a proposal that's followed by a response. He makes a second proposal that's followed by another response. He makes a third proposal that's followed then by another response. And then we see a conclusion of the transaction. Let's follow this together just for a moment here. Verses 3 and 4, we see Abraham's first proposal. It says there, Abraham rose. Now, this is significant because first he goes in, verse 2, to mourn for his wife, but he doesn't stay there in the pit of sorrow 
in death, he moves and is active to do something. So he rose up from his dead wife, Sarah, and he goes to the Hittites who are, who are there in the land of Canaan. And he says to them in verse 4, I am a sojourner and foreigner among you. This is so important. Abraham is still a guest in the land of Canaan. And so he has to seek permission to bury his wife, Sarah, there. And so that is essentially what his first request is. So the Hittites respond then in verses 5 and 6 by first saying to him, Hear us, my Lord, you are a prince of God among us. And so just like we saw with Abimelech who saw that the Lord was with Abraham. Here, even with the Hittites, they see that Abraham is blessed by the Lord. But they say to him, hear us, and then they say, bury your dead. Now, this is interesting, just for a moment. There are these exchanges of commands between Abraham and these people that he's working with. So Abraham, in verse 4, says, give me property. And then in verse 6, they say, bury your dead. Later, Ephron will say the same thing, bury your dead. And then Abraham uh, will say to him, listen to me. There's this exchange of commands. And this is really interesting because what we see here is the generosity of the Hittites and Ephron to Abraham in the midst of his sorrow and pain. God providentially cares for Abraham in these moments of sorrow and grief. It's, it's a lot like if you go to lunch with a coworker and you say, hey, man, you, you choose where we go to lunch. And he's like, no, you choose. There's a lot of generosity that's happening here in the providence of God. And they say to him in their response, bury your dead in the choicest of the tombs. No one will hinder you from burying your wife here. But we need to understand at this point that Abraham is not simply looking for a, a favor to bury his, his wife. He is looking for something more attainable for the future. He's looking to purchase land. So we see this in his second request that you see there in verses 7 through 9. He asks for this one Ephron who apparently owns this field that has a cave in it that he wants to bury, purchase and bury his wife there. And in God's providence, Ephron happens to be there, verse 10. Ephron's sitting among them and what is Ephron's response? Verse 11, he says, Lord, hear me. I give you the field, and I give you the cave that is in it. In the sight of the sons of my people, I give it to you. Bury your dead. And so we see again this generosity. He wants to give the cave to him in a gift to, to bury his wife there. But again, we have to understand for Abraham just to receive this as a gift as opposed to buying and purchasing the land for himself would then put him under obligation to Ephron and the Hittites. He's looking for something more. He's looking to purchase the land. And so we see that then in his final request. He asks for a price to be named. And then in the final response, Ephron says uh, the, the, the amount there of 400 shekels. And so Abraham purchases the land. You see there in verse 17. So the field of Ephron in Machpelah, which was to the east of Mamre, the field with the cave that was in it, and all the trees that were in the field throughout its whole area were made over or deeded over to Abraham as a possession in the presence of the Hittites. This is a legal transaction that has happened here. Abraham has purchased the land. Now, there's a couple other things that I want us to see here that's important to help us understand exactly what the significance of this is. Notice the central theme of the text, which is death. Over and over again, Sarah is referred to as the dead one. Verse 3, Abraham rose up from before his dead. Verse 4, he says that I may bury my dead. Verse 6, the Hittites say, bury your dead. Verse 8, if you are willing that I should bury my dead. Ephron refers to her as your dead. Twice he tells Abraham to bury his dead. Again, the, the heart issue of the, uh, of the passage here, the, the, the struggle of the passage is that Sarah is dead. She is gone. But the second half of that is the portion of land that Abraham looks to buy. Notice, too, all of the, the terms that are used to identify this property. Verse 4, he says that, give me property for a burying place. And then we see words used like tomb and cave. This field is mentioned with all the trees that are around it. Verse 17, you see the field of Ephron, the field with the cave that were there in the field. Verse 19, the cave of the field of Machpelah in the land of Canaan, the field and the cave, the property for a burying place 
Death and this property that he purchases are central to this story. This is a legal transaction that has happened here. And Abraham has laid claim to this burial place for his wife. Why is this important? I want us to turn to Genesis 50 to help help us understand this. You turn with me for just a moment to Genesis 50. And as you're turning there, I want to give you a little bit of background to the the two verses we're going to read here. Genesis 50, verses 12 and 13. So Abraham's son is Isaac. Isaac's son is Jacob. Jacob has 12 sons. One of those sons is Joseph. And you know the story of Joseph. He was sold into slavery, into Egypt. In God's providence, he becomes second in command. He saves the world from a famine. He encounters his brothers. And he brings his entire family, Jacob and his sons and all of his daughters, into Egypt. And they're residing in Egypt. And on Jacob's deathbed, he makes makes a request to Joseph that he would not bury him in Egypt, but that he would bury him in his homeland, the land of Canaan. And so in verse 12 of Genesis 50, Jacob has died, and it says, Thus his sons did for him as he commanded them. For his sons carried him to the land of Canaan and buried him in the cave of the field at Machpelah, to the east of Mamre, which Abraham bought with the field from Ephron the Hittite, to possess as a burying place. He goes and is buried in his homeland, the land of promise, the land of Canaan, in the cave where his grandmother Sarah was buried. Again, why is this important? Back in chapter 23, when Abraham goes to these great links to lay claim to this land, this place to bury his wife, he is saying this, there is no going back. There's no going back to the land of my fathers. Remember in chapter 12, what did God say to Abraham initially? Leave your country and your people and your father's household and go to the land in which I will show you, the land of Canaan. He is there. And it would have been customary for him to bury his wife in her homeland. And he would have had every right at this moment to say, Lord, the the, the promise obviously isn't coming in my lifetime, so I'm just going to pack my bags and go home. But no, Abraham trusts in the promise of God. And he purchases this land in the promised land, and he buries his wife there. And so in verses 19 and 20, at the close of the story, it's exactly what he does. He, Abraham buried his wife in the cave of the field of Machpelah, east of Mamre, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. The field and the cave that is in it were deeded over to Abraham as property for a burying place by the Hittites. The death of Sarah provides another opportunity for Abraham's faith in God to be manifested in his actions. Here at the death of his precious wife, although he mourns and grieves for her, he says this, I will rest in the promises of God. Although he has not seen it fulfilled in his lifetime, By burying his wife in this place that God has brought him to in covenant fellowship, he shows that his hope is not in this life, but in the life to come. One commentator said this, God's promises are not exhausted in this lifetime. And church, we are to live with this eternal perspective. I mentioned my grandparents earlier. One, one of my grandparents, my, my mother's mom, we called her nanny, always had a, a phrase that she would say, and she always had something to say. And one of the things that she would say a lot was, kids, you know, there, there's never a U-Haul truck behind a hearse in the funeral procession. As a kid, I always kind of thought that was a little strange, but, but, but the truth that was there resonated me as a child. We, we don't take anything with us from this life. This is a moment, this is, a, this is a, 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 a snapshot in all of eternity, and when we pass from this life into the next, our hope is not found in the things that we have here in this life. Jesus speaks this way in Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, verse 19, Jesus said this, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. Where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. 
In John chapter 14, he talks about going to a prepare a place for us, that where he is, we will be with him also. Church, if you are in Christ today, you will one day pass from this life into the next. And the assurance for you today is this, you will be with Christ for all eternity. And so the application here for us then from Genesis 23 is, is somewhat twofold. The first one is very practical. And we see this in the actions of Abraham. Death, the, the death of a loved one presents a unique opportunity for us to fall away from God. How many times do you see someone who is a professing Christian and, and, and there's a tragic death that happens in their life and they fall away? From the Lord. Many of us have seen this. Or maybe they fall into sin and disobedience. Abraham could have gone back to Ur. He could have gone back to the, 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 his father's land, his homeland. But he sets an example for us by trusting in God's prov- promises and walking in obedience to him. Again, build your theology of death today. When the death of a loved one comes, may we have a resolve in our faith. May we be set in our faith to be immovable. Come what may, Lord, we will be faithful and obedient to you. Even in the face of death, the sorrow and the grief of death, we have a call to walk in obedience to our master. May that be said of us. But the secondary application and the primary application of the text is this, is something I've already said, our hope is in heaven. The fullness of the promises of God will come in the next life where we will experience the glories of heaven for all eternity. No more sin, no more pain, no more hurt and and sickness and tears and sorrow and grief and sadness, no more death. But there will be nothing but Christ for all eternity and joy and hope and happiness and complete knowledge in his presence. Knowing him for who he is and what he has done and worshiping him for all of eternity. There is no more sorrow. There is no more grief in heaven. And so children who are here this morning, sometimes we hear of heaven. We think, man, that heaven sounds terrible. It's just going to be one big worship service for the rest of eternity. That sounds so boring. But kids, that is not what heaven will be like. I want you to think of that one thing in this life that brings you so much joy and so much happiness. Whatever that is, and I want you to multiply those, those, those realities of joy and happiness in that moment. And I want you to multiply it by a billion. And that that you have in that moment pales in comparison to the joy and in and the, and the presence of Christ for all eternity. That is the hope of heaven, that we will be with him and we are to live with this perspective. We, like Abraham and Sarah, are sojourners and foreigners in a foreign land. This is not our home. It is far better for us to be with Jesus than it is to be here in this flesh. But until then, we are to live faithfully to our master, knowing that this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. That the trials and the persecution and the suffering that we face in this life is just for a moment. And is preparing for us something far greater than we could ever comprehend in this life in eternity with Christ. So we rest in that hope today and we live our lives in view of that hope today. I want to close with just the the final stanza of the hymn Amazing Grace. Isaac Watts says this, When we've been there 10,000 years, Bright shining as the sun. We know less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. The hope of heaven when we have been there for 10,000 years will feel like we've just started eternity. What a joy it will be to be in the presence of our Lord and Savior. I wonder today,
Do you know the hope of heaven? Dear friend, death is coming to you, but there is a promise that is sure and set beyond this life. That promise is life eternal that is found in Christ and Christ alone, who lived a sinless life and died on the cross, bearing the complete wrath and weight of sin upon himself so that when you believe in him in faith, you may be set free from bondage to sin and death. And he proved that by rising victoriously over the grave on the third day. He is not in a tomb. He is alive and well. He has risen indeed. And right now he sits at the right hand of the Father in heaven. And if you believe in him today and repent and turn from your sins, you will know the hope that is found in him and him alone. Today is the day of salvation. Believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ and be saved. Let us pray.